This story starts in a blue world made of lonesome islands scattered around a great sea. Of rotten underground waterways and mighty deserts where sand is not sand, but finally broken down iridescent glass. Amidst the miserable strips of land drawn on worn out maps, one can read Sea of the Unknown. And indeed, next to nothing is known about its unexplored shores or those who inhabit them. Old tales have it that the glass in the desert occasionally shifts and fuses with itself in a marvelous spectacle to form giant glaciers made of pure, transparent beauty. There are 23 different kinds of wind in this world, which constantly blow over the land. The clouds are dissected and the skies are marked and measured by ever-flowing lines of mystical dust. In the rare occasion when the twisted form of wilderness meets civilization, it does so in the form of titan-sized towers made of curved, flowing shapes that display grandiose craftsmanship and impressive control of the elements. A wise observer would perhaps stop here, so as to not damage this aesthetic experience halfway between the dreamlike and the supernatural. Their imagination would be lulled by the surreal shapes around them, their reason blurred by the awe that follows any person's first encounter with magic. Should you decide to continue on your journey, however, you would soon get a glimpse of a more mundane and earthly place. A world beneath a world. Far below the surface, on the lower depths of the highly crafted tower cities, would glow the eternal gloom of Tide Hollow, a dark underworld inhabited by unwholesome creatures. Soon, you'd find out that it was all just an illusion. There is no such thing as untamed wilderness on Esper. Everything is well thought and designed to meet exact specifications. This story, then, starts on a blue-aligned world called Esper. But this world is not only blue, it is also white and black. There, the power of human and Vidalka mages is uncontested, and a dystopian form of magocracy is established. Highly skilled engineers called artificers have created all kinds of artifacts and machines, blending and mastering the art of Ethereum craftsmanship. Ethereum is an ether-infused filigree metal omnipresent on Esper, which bestows supernatural skills and extended lifespans upon its users. But more importantly than anything else, this story starts on a world, which is actually not a world, but a shard, a fraction of a bigger one. One of five fractions, to be exact. Alara was the original name of the plane. It was once a serene plane, with little or no internal conflicts, at peace with its neighbors, until a cataclysmic event befell it. The ancient accounts call it the Sundering. Little is known about it, except that it was caused by an unknown planeswalker who, in an attempt to drain the world of its mana, fractured the plane into five shards as a result. Bant, Esper, Grixis, Jant, and Naya were thus created. And it is right here on Esper, precisely in Tide Hollow, a set of slums sheltered from the weather inside an enormous cavern that constantly smells of fish, Maldu, and despair, that the story of Tezzeret begins. Tezzeret was born some time after the Great Mending to a couple of Ethereum scrapper parents living in the lowest part of Tide Hollow. The Mending had been a cosmological event initiated by the Planeswalker Jeska, which had healed the multiverse and at the same time had rebalanced the power of the Planeswalker's spark. The kid didn't have an happy childhood, as neither of his parents cared enough for the boy to even give him a name. Tezzeret's father was violent and abusive while the mother was a prostitute who had grown too old to exercise her trade. The beatings happened on a daily basis, but despite the ever-toxic family environment in which she grew up, Tezzeret had plenty of peers. It was his peers, in fact, that named him Tezzeret, the word being tied hollow slang for an improvised weapon, and it was given to him after he'd stopped an older boy who had bullied him. Tezzeret was only five at this time, and the other boy was eight. Tezzeret's life would further be completely subverted at the age of seven, when his mother died. While banging in the lower suburbs of Vectis, the capital city of Esper, she had been run over on the roadside by a guildmaster's carriage, suffering an agonizing death and leaving Tezzeret and his father to fend for themselves. 
While cleaning the mess of the street, Tezret's father planted the first seeds of what one day would become the boy's understanding of the world. The strong grew, and they take whatever they want from the weak, and on Esper there is no power greater than that of mages. The disillusionment, frustration, and anger conveyed by the man's words took solid roots in the boy's heart, and in that moment he swore to grow up to become a mage so that none could take anything from him ever again. The following day, at dawn, Tezret began helping his father salvage metal scraps from the chess pools. It was during this time that the boy found out about his natural talent in rhabdomancy, a divination technique which he used to find ethereum fragments more easily than his father. Because Tezzeret was much more efficient in retrieving the metal due to his magical skills, his father soon began to deal solely with the selling part of the business. Taking advantage of the lonely daytime expeditions to the chess pools, the kid began stealing moderate amounts of ethereum each day at the age of nine. A ferocious beating would follow each time he was caught by the father, which was almost always intentional as it allowed him to get away with stealing even more ethereum while his father believed him pacified. Although he kept enduring his father's abuses and the almost daily beatings for years, Tezzeret never stopped planning for his escape. Over the years, he also rose in the Taidalo's gang ranks through the use of blind violence and stabbing the mothers of anyone who dared to cross paths or defy him. This was his way of showing them how weak they were. At the age of 11, he had managed to steal a total of 200 grams of ethereum, most of which he had hidden beneath his skin and air. With this small investment, Tezzeret fled Tide Hollow without looking back, leaving the old father to whatever life he could make for himself. Freedom had always been Tezzeret's life goal. Freedom from the poverty and violence of his family. Freedom from the desolation of Tide Hollow. Freedom from the pain and torment of his own past. But now that it reached it, the young man realized that freedom was not at all his point of arrival. He was not truly interested in being at peace. The scars of his past had gouged scars too deep to be forgotten. No, he would not stop until he'd taken it all back. He would not stop until he had it all. This was only his beginning. Soon after he fled the chess pools of Tide Hollow, Tezzeret apprenticed to an artificer's laboratory in Upper Vectis. He took a new name and swore loyalty to the engineer for seven years. It took only three, however, for Tezzeret to master all the artificer's teachings and insights. Unwilling to waste more time with a man that couldn't teach him anything new, Tezzeret broke his oath four years in advance and, at the age of 14, he fled and began to seek out hidden caches of ethereum buried around the city. His rhabdomancy skills, of course, proved incredibly useful in his quest, and the number of caches he could find was surprisingly high. Meanwhile, to top up his gains, he would periodically use one of the precious metal-filled troves he had found to lure bandit groups into attacking him on the side of isolated roads, only to slaughter and rob them of any stash of ethereum that they might have had. Soon, leaving a trail of blood and brutality behind him, he had gathered enough ethereum to pay a year's tuition and enter the Mechanist's Guild. Tezzeret sought to become a master at manipulating magical artifacts as opposed to the more mundane artifice that he had already honed. This was a long and demanding path, and it usually took people 17 years to fully master this art. Tezzeret accomplished it in mere five. He was by far the best student that the guild had ever thought to. As a result of that, he earned his journeyman status, usually awarded to the students who had completed their 17 years worth of study, much sooner than his colleagues, and through the guild's supply, he gained even more access to the ethereum that he desperately wanted. And so, at the age of 19, Tezzeret could finally fulfill a dream that he had fostered for half his life, since he had started stealing from his father at the age of 9. He performed an extremely challenging ritual that severed his right arm and replaced it with a solid ethereum one of over 10 kilos worth of metal. He succeeded, and upon seeing what he had done, the mechanist guild masters immediately invested him with the master status of the guild. Tezzeret, however, had no interest in leading the guild. He felt different, renewed, but still not satisfied. He wanted more. So, he left the guild never to return, heading directly to the Academy of Seekers.
The next stop on his journey was the City Academy, located in the capital city's upper yard. Vectis was a very unique city. Its lower levels rose across a huge crevice below the ground and in the intricate system of tunnels and openings that unraveled in the depths of the earth. The lack of available space touched by the sunlight had forced his first settlers to work vertically. They had taken advantage of the unstable strips of land that faced the inside of the crack and used them to build precarious shelters and even more precarious bridges across the edges. Then they voraciously kept building, until no space was left. The slums of Tight Hollow were born. Then, far in the distance along the crack, the buildings would crawl out of the fissure up into the real world, where the upper, richest and largest part of the city stood, Upper Vectis. Upper Vectis was home to merchants, artificers and engineers alike. It was here that Tezzeret had spent the last eight years of his life. Atop Upper Vectis, then, there was a whole other part of the city. It was known as Upper Yard, and at its center stood the Vectis Academy, the highest and most respected institution in the city and home to the Seekers of Karmat. The Seekers of Karmat was a sect of mages on Esper who sought one of the two mythical ingredients supposedly needed to manufacture Ethereum, the Karmat while the second one was called Sangrite. To look for it, they would use the Codex Ethereum, or Filigree Texts, which was a series of 23 tomes stored in the Sanctum Arcanum, a fortress in the clouds that also functioned as a headquarters for the organization. The Ethereum Texts were said to contain all Asper knowledge, including the exact location of Comet. The reason why the Asperites couldn't craft new Ethereum alloys was that both Sangrite and Karmut were materials that could only be found on Junt, one of the other four shards of Alara, inaccessible to mortals because physically detached from Esper. Although, no one knew this at the time. Sangrite, instead, was a kind of bloodstone that sprouted over the corpse of dragons who had died in battle, while Karmut was a unique type of redstone which would form only if particular conditions were met. As a test to enter the Seekers, Tezzeret had to fight a certain Silas Ren in duel. Silas was a human Esperite, heir to the House of Ren, which was perhaps the most influential family of the Esper elite. However, too eager to prove his worth, Tezzeret exposed himself to the enemy. He lost the fight, his powers were deemed unworthy of the Seekers, and his application was rejected. The young artificer would not give up, though. That same night, he went back to the academy seeking to meet the headmaster Amulet Panex to clarify the quality of his performance. As you might have guessed, he was not met with hospitality nor kindness. Panex informed him that the final decision had been taken and the next day he was to be expelled. In addition to the poor performance against Ren, the reasons for the punishment were to be sought in Tezzeret's lowly origins, which would have been a stain in the reputation of the academy. Unwilling to accept his faith, and driven by blind rage and contempt towards the institution, Tezzeret murdered Panax, and did his best to cover his tracks. The following day, shock and anger pervaded Upper Yard, although to this day, no one could ever uncover any clue that could lead to the Headmaster's assassin. Three years passed, and Tezzeret kept being looked down upon with disdain by his peers. By defeating Tezzeret three years before, on the other hand, Silas had become the youngest adept among the Seekers, and to celebrate this, he was granted the first ever created Ethereum Heart. Tezzeret had had enough. He decided to break into the vault containing the Codex Ethereum to acquire its teaching for himself, but he remained utterly shocked when he discovered that the tomes were actually a fraud. The pages were all blank. Tezzeret stood still, staring in bewilderment and scorn at the pathetic lie upon which the greatest and most feared sect of Vectis was built. He had never felt such hatred before, not even for his own family. Behind him, in the meantime, a dozen guards had gathered at the sound of the alarm. Tezzeret's trespass would not go unpunished this time. The soldiers ferociously beat the artificer, trying their best to kill him once and for all. Between the blows, the blood, the pain, and the loathing, Tezzeret was once again able to keep his clarity of mind and to channel his emotion into a single feeling of pure hate towards the Seeker and their dirty lies. In that brief moment of canalization, his spark ignited and the planes walked wildly, falling through the silent infinity of blind eternities without any kind of guidance. After what felt like an immeasurable amount of time, he awoke on Grixis, the third of Lara's shards, not knowing how or why it had gotten there. 
Miraculously, he managed to survive the attacks of the black and blue Grixis monster lurking in the wild and long wandered this unknown land looking for answers. One night, after he traveled for weeks, he found himself in a wide, scorched valley standing before Nicol Bolas himself. Okay, so who is Nicol Bolas and what is he doing here? As far as anyone knows, Nicol Bolas is the oldest planeswalker in the multiverse. Ages before remembered history, Bolas established empires across multiple planes, hoarded secrets and treasures beyond number, and vanquished potential rivals ranging from a demon leviathan to other ancient dragons. Truly, he wielded the power of a god, an immortal being of near-limitless magical strength and knowledge approaching omniscience. When rifts in the fabric of time threatened to destroy Dominaria, Bolas actually helped to heal the time rift, but at a terrible cost. Stabilizing the fundamental structure of the multiverse, a phenomenon called the Mending, also limited the power of planeswalkers, robbing them of both omnipotence and immortality. Bolas felt his powers drain, and his knowledge, accumulated over the millennia, seep away like water through a sieve. His vast intellect would still dwarf the minds of the short-lived minions who served him. And so, he conjured schemes, wove twisting plans inside of plans, and charted a path that, he knew, would lead him back to divinity, to the power that was his birthright. I was old before this world was ever born. I have devoured stars and shattered worlds. I have sired whole races, populated entire planes, and then hunted them to extinction for my amusement. I have bathed in the blood of gods and used their bones to build my nest. I am the Mind Ripper, the Death Bringer, the Winged Dark that terrifies your dreams. I have no beginning and no end. I am Nicol Bolas, Planeswalker, Helder Dragon, the oldest and most powerful being that has ever or shall ever exist. He is cruel, ruthless, extremely dangerous and powerful beyond imagination. He also has a twin brother named Ugin, although many call him the Spirit Dragon. As we have mentioned, after the Mending, Bolas had lost much of his 25,000 years old ancestral knowledge and with it, his old power had greatly diminished too. In order to regain it, the dragon had fled to the Shard of Grixis, where he began conducting experiments and machinations of various kinds. His goal was to take advantage of the imminent conflicts, an upcoming natural cosmological event that very few people were aware of, and use it to re-spark his ancient powers. The conflicts was supposed to bring the five shards of Alara back together into a single plane, releasing an unprecedented amount of energy that would have perfectly served Bolas's aims. In order for his plan to work, however, the dragon needed not to be interrupted. So, he traveled to Grixis and began manipulating various individuals across the five shards to foster an environment ripe with tension and ready for conflict. War would have been the perfect distraction. By forcing the five shards to converge and collide again, he believed that he could draw on the magical energy thus unleashed and accomplish his apotheosis. He sowed seeds of conflict through his agents on all five shards, preparing them all for the wars that would break out when the world would begin to overlap. As Bolas's plan came to fruition, the five shards converged into a single plane that flowed with all five colors of mana once more. Waves of raw power crashed across the former planar boundaries, bringing long-forgotten forms of magic to all shards and mingling them in unprecedented ways. Cultures crashed and wars erupted, and Bolas severed it all. A great milestone of mana sparked to life in the heart of the Five Plains, and Bolas stepped into it. At the mercy of Bolas, Tazerth was offered immense powers by the Elder Dragon who, in exchange, demanded the man's unquestioned loyalty and servitude. The ambitious Esperite, who valued power and the ability of being feared above all else, eagerly accepted. With time, however, ambition became greater than his word, and Tezzeret orchestrated a coup under Bolas's unaware watch. Thus, in an unspecified future following his ascension and subsequent pact with Bolas, the Artificer secretly built his own infrastructure of agents inside Bolas's mercantile organization known as Infinite Consortium. In one fell swoop, he commanded the killing of all high-ranking cell leaders directly subordinated to Bolas, replaced them with his own people, and effectively took over the consortium leadership.
Sometime after this, Tezzeret made an alliance with the plane of New Phyrexia, formerly known as Mirrodin, and its five brother rulers. He then traveled to the plane of Kamigawa, and there, with the help of the cyber futurist living in Otawara, he developed a prototype reality chip. The reality chip was an illegal bio announcement that would alter the very physics of reality. Specifically, it could augment pre existing power to the point of even igniting latent sparks. After infiltrating the Imperial Palace of Eiganjo, Tezzeret tried to use the prototype to exert his control on Kyodai, an ancient dragon spirit and world soul of Kamigawa, but his plan had unforeseen consequences. The latent spark of the current Emperor of Kamigawa was accidentally ignited by the energy released in the process. However, because the Emperor's ascension had not been natural, the chip left her spark unstable, causing irregularities with her planeswalking ability which made her known as the Wanderer. After his attack on Kyodai had failed, Tazeret fled Kamigawa to return on Ravnica. As time passed, Tazeret grew increasingly paranoid of Bolas's spies and sought out Jace Bellerin to join the Infinite Consortium. It was during this time that, through his own networks, Tazeret found out about the secret position of Bolas as Master of the Seekers of Karmat. As head of the sect, Bolas had to know about the Codex Ethereum fraud that had nearly cost Tazeret his life. His scorn for the skimming Elder Dragon possibly grew even stronger after this. The Artificer then invested a huge amount of time and energy in Jace's training, sure that the Mind Mage's unique telepathic powers would prove useful in preventing Bolas's agents from secretly infiltrating the organization. One day, Tezzeret and Bolas entered in direct conflict over the mining rights to a specific mountain range on an unknown plane. Tezzeret suggested a face-to-face -face confrontation to negotiate the issue. To the meeting, he took Jace along in the hopes that the Blue Mage could protect him from Bolas, whom Tezzeret feared might have had telepathic abilities of his own. Unfortunately for the duo, things didn't even come close to work out as expected. Bolas effortlessly crushed Jace's defenses and plumbed Tezzeret's minds for whatever information and secrets he could find. Then, the Dragon God left the two disoriented men at the mercy of a group of barbarian mercenaries he had hired to kill them. By using the last bits of physical might and magic they had left, Tezzeret and Jace managed to barely escape with their lives and went back on Ravnica. Furious and livid, Tezzeret held Jace the sole responsible for their failure and, as punishment, he issued an ultimatum to him. The Blue Mage had one last chance to prove his worth. When Jace voluntarily failed his next assignment, Tezzeret's resentment and anger turned to hatred and thirst for revenge. The Esperite began dreaming about Jace's death as just retribution for all the wasted time he had invested in him. Eventually, Tezzeret and Jace met each other on the battlefield thanks to the manipulation of Liliana Vess, who was Jace's lover at the time. Liliana had been promised freedom from her demonic contract by Bolas if she had managed to return the control of the Infinite Consortium to him. The battle between the two mages was short, as Tezzeret quickly managed to trap Jace using some of the magical artifacts he had created. Then, the Artificer had his second-in-command Baltris torture the Blue Mage while they worked on a new device to erase Jace's memories and transform him into his puppet. Before his goal was achieved, however, Jace took advantage of Baltris's distraction and broke free from his imprisonment. He easily defeated his jailer in a single combat and attacked Tezzeret once more. This time, the fight was much fiercer. The two fought across different planes and for what seems like entire days, but in the end, Tezzeret lost the duel on the world of Kamigawa and his mind was utterly obliterated. During the battle, Tezzeret also lost his precious Ethereum arm to the Monoblade, another one of his creations that had been stolen by Jace. A brain-dead Tezzeret was left for dead in the burning village that had been the final stage of their duel. The Nizumi Ratfolk found him, an empty usk incapable of even uttering a simple word. Soon after, Nicol Bolas arrived in Kamigawa and bargained from Tezzeret's mangled and mindless body. No, Liliana's effort had not restored to him the Infinite's Consortium, but they had given him instead an opportunity even he had not foreseen. It had cost him greatly to acquire it and would require much labor on his part to make it functional once more, both inside and out. With the right repairs, though, and the right adjustments, it just might prove a greater tool than even the consortium itself. Nicol Bolas bent low over the mangled and mindless body of Tazeret. Now, now, little artificer. What shall we do with you?
Then, the dragon took the man's body to his keep in the meditation realm, and no one knew how much time he spent there. After retrieving Tazeret from Kamigawa, Bolas literally rebuilt him. His ethereum arm now was jagged and glowed sickly red, and his midsection and legs were now also all of frameworks of ethereum. Tazeret owed Bolas his life and served the Dragon Planeswalker grudgingly afterwards. In the process of rebuilding, the Dragon God also added a tattoo of his own symbol to the Artificer's forehead, so that the man would never again forget to whom he owed his loyalty. His first mission as an agent of Bolas was to visit the Plain of Mirrodin, which was in the throes of an invasion by the bizarre machine creatures of Phyrexia. Tezzeret was instructed to observe the growth of Phyrexia and report its progress to his master, and also to prevent the Phyrexian forces from uniting under a single leader. During all this time, Tezzeret still blamed Bolas for the Codex Eterium fraud, and because of this, he hated the dragon with every fiber of his being. After everything he'd been through and the pain he had endured, the Artificer initially refused to submit to the Elder Dragon again and killed all of the imp minions that Bolas had sent to check on him on New Phyrexia and to prevent a second coup like the one at the Consortium. Fear, however, can be stronger than any other sentiment, and when Bolas himself showed up to reprimand his servant, Tezzeret put his contempt aside and immediately obeyed to his master. After having landed near the city stronghold of Lumengrid on Euphorexia, Tazeret was injected by a Vedalcan servant of Bolas with a serum that made him immune to Phyresis. Phyresis, which means progressive generation, is the process of transformation of a living thing into a Phyrexian creature. After the process, the creature is considered to be completed, where completion is the state of Phyrexian maturity and perfection. Thyresis had been developed by the Thrawn physician Yogmoth as he was trying to salvage the descendants of the Tysis infected Thrawn. The disease would spread through the glistening oil, also known as Phyrexian oil, which was a viscous substance engineered by the Phyrexian to spread their corruption through entire planes. If you want to know more about this, check out the video in the top right corner of your screen. But let's go back to Tezzeret for now. Because he was the direct servant of Bolas, the Artificer had the privilege to establish himself within the Phyrexian ranks without undergoing completion. His first encounter on the plane was with the Blue Alliance Praetor ruler of New Phyrexia, Jin Jetaxias, who introduced the man directly to Karn, the time-traveling silver golem planeswalker, original father of the plane and created by Urza himself. Karn was not an ally of the Phyrexian per se, but because he had lost his spark, the golem had fallen victim of the glistening oil and his mind had been corrupted. Without entering into too much detail, what matters to us is that at the moment, Karn is living an internal battle in his own mind between himself and the role of father of the machines that the five Praetor rulers alongside a completed Glissa Sunseeker and Lord Geth are trying to force upon him. Tezzeret subtly worked his way closer and closer to Karn until he sat at his right hand alongside the same Lord Geth and Glissa Sunseeker. As Koth of the Amur and his allies sought to free Karn from his mental imprisonment, Tezzeret made his own move against Geth and Glissa, plotting to usurp Karn's throne. This resulted in a direct fight with Glissa, the outcome of which, however, is unknown. What is also unknown is if Tezzeret could have actually usurped the throne even if he had defeated Glissa. What we know for sure, instead, is that Tezzeret was later present alongside the five praetors to the crowning ceremony of a new father or mother of the machines that followed Karn's liberation. The frontrunner for the position was the white aligned praetor Elish Norn, who had taken control over the territories of the black aligned praetor Sheoldred, the Whispering One, and of the red aligned praetor Urabrashk, the Hidden. Eventually, Elash Norn won, and she currently is the dominant praetor and mother of the machines. An unknown period of time later, Tazeret relocated to the plain of Kaladesh using money supplied by Bolas. There, he established himself as the head judge of the inventor's fair in Girapur, the capital city of the plain. The fair was a month-long event to celebrate the myriad inventions of the Great Ether Boom. It drew millions of inventors and fans from across the entire plane and featured the most diverse exposition of artifice in a variety of fields. The event was sponsored directly by the Consulate, the omnipresent dictatorship that ruled all over Kaladesh. During the fair, Tazeret identified a certain Pianalar and had her captured. 
If you're wondering, Pia was indeed the mother of the well-known pyromancer Chandra Nalar and she was also the commander of the resistance in Girapur. Acting as head judge then, Tesseret crowned the elven inventor Rashmi as winner of the competition before facing Pia in a quicksmithing match. Using his superior knowledge of artifice and magic, Tesseret easily defeated Pia and almost killed her if not for Chandra's intervention. Tazaret was confident he could beat the young pyromancer too, but when the assembled gatewatch revealed themselves behind her, the situation changed. Tazaret summoned his constructs to keep the gatewatch busy. Then, amidst the chaos of battle, he declared the inventor's fair to be over and retreated to Sky Sovereign, the largest airship of the consulate. At this point, Jay started to suspect that the whole fight between Tezzeret and Pia had been a ploy, as Tezzeret had protected his mind from telepathic attacks, meaning he had somehow anticipated Jace's presence at the fair. Soon after, the planeswalker Saheli Rai revealed to the Gatewatch that Tezzeret had used the destruction and spectacle of the battle to have his troops confiscate all inventions that had been displayed at the fair. Moreover, the Asperite Artificer had also taken some of the most brilliant participants and inventors as prisoners. While the Gatewatch were trying to figure out what Tezzeret's plans were, he met with the Vadal Complainswalker Dovin Ban in the Ether Spire. There, Tezzeret entrusted Dovin with the task of dealing with the Gatewatch and the growing threat posed by the Resistance. Then, Tezzeret retreated into an inquirium, which was a sort of research laboratory, and began studying the teleportation device that Rashmi herself had exhibited at the fair. Meanwhile, the situation in Girapur would increasingly get out of hand. In the wake of the ever-growing threat of attacks from the Resistance, Tezzeret was granted emergency powers and declared Grand Consul. Now able to exert the greatest authority within Girapur, Tezzeret started to redirect the vast majority of the ether supply of the whole city to the ether spire to fuel his experiments. In the meantime, he would supervise the work of the captive inventors of the fair, pushing them beyond their limits and threatening to punish with death any failure that would not live up to his expectations. He was particularly interested in the work of Rashmi, who, during her imprisonment, completed the planar portal and in the process became aware of the multiverse. After her breakthrough with the portal, Tazaret dismissed the Elven Inventor and claimed the invention as his own. Rashmi, however, understood that this was her only chance to ever escape. So, she claimed that the device was still a malfunctioning prototype and, as such, she needed to perfect it. Tazaret allowed her to tend to the portal and, in a moment of distraction, the Elven Woman took her chance to flee. Soon after this, as the situation in Girapur kept worsening, Tezzeret was elected Special Grand Consul and was endowed with even more powers and authority by the other consuls to tame the other revolts. Then, he relocated permanently to Sky Sovereign to avoid being found by Liliana Vess and Saeli Rai, who, in the meantime, had received a tip on his previous whereabouts in the other spire. Meanwhile, the Resistance had taken control of the central Ether hub of the city and was now reorganizing its forces to launch an offensive on the consulate's headquarters. Shortly after, as he was standing to the planar bridge, Tazeret was reached by Liliana and Aaron Dead, a top sky sovereign. At first, the man greeted Liliana, thinking that Bolas had sent the necromancer to check on his progress with the planar bridge. But then, he was utterly shocked to learn that Liliana was now part of the Gatewatch forces. The two fought harshly and with no holds bared. Tezzeret using his metal magic and Liliana wielding her command over death. During the fight, a still skeptical Tezzeret repeatedly questioned Liliana's allegiance to the Gatewatch, trying to incite her against Jace, mocking her of how weak she'd become because of love. In the end, drawing fully on the power of the Chain Veil, Liliana overwhelmed Tezzeret, and having him pinned down to the ground, she asked the man where Bolas had hidden. Not able to bear the excruciating pain any longer, Tazaret betrayed his master and revealed the place to be Amonkhet, the same plane where Razaketh, one of the four demons that held Liliana's contract, dwelled. Satisfied with the information received, Liliana prepared to deliver the final blow when Chandra and Gideon crashed into the Pranar Bridge, apparently destroying it. However, amidst the confusion, Tazaret managed to escape Liliana's grip and planes walked away bringing the still intact core of the portal with him. Sometime after Girapur, in the build-up of the War of the Sparks, the guildmasters Rashka, Ral Zarek, Kaya, Lavinia and Raktas Emissary Ekara joined forces against Bolas on the plain of Ravnica. 
the Ractus Emissary Akara was slaughtered by a bolus possessed Lavinia, whose mind had fallen prey to the dragon god after Tezzeret had planted a device on her neck. Moreover, Tezzeret had incorporated the planar bridge into his own body and could now function as conduit between the planes of Amonkhet and Ravnica for the invasion of the Eternal Dreadhorde. If you're not aware of this, the War of the Spark was an interplanar conflict fought on Ravnica that saw Bolas's Eternal Dreadhorde led by the enslaved Liliana Vess fighting off the Ravnican and Gatewatch forces. Bolas's endgame was to trap as many planeswalkers as possible on the plane to make use of the ancient Elder spell to ruthlessly kill them and harvest the planeswalkers' sparks to achieve ultimate power and godhood. If you wish to know more, check out my Liliana Vest Complete Lore video where there's a part dedicated entirely to this. During the war, the planeswalkers Dak Fiden, Ob Nixilis, Karn Liberated and Samut managed to reverse travel to Amonkhet through the same planar bridge used by the Horde to shut off the device that Tezzeret was operating on the other side. They easily found Tezzeret and attacked him using a device designed by Saheli Rai. This made the portal inside Tezzeret's chest explode, which immediately led to the implosion and collapse of the mirrored portal that Eternal Soldiers were actually walking through on Ravnica. After having healed himself with magic, Tezzeret surprisingly congratulated with the walkers, wishing them luck in the fight against Bolas, and claiming that with the Elder Dragon out of the way, there would be no one left with the power to thwart him. Then, before the others could even say a word, he planes walked away, disappearing within a silver cloud. Thanks to Liliana's betrayal and Gideon's sacrifice, the Gatewatch eventually ended up defeating Bolas and winning the War of the Sparks on Ravnica. In the aftermath of the conflict, the reborn living Gilpak Niv Mizzet declared Tezzeret to be one of the three planeswalkers guilty of assisting Nicol Bolas. As punishment for his crimes, Tezzeret was assigned to the Izzet Guildmaster Raul Zarek, who was entrusted with tracking the artificer down and kill him. Although he had healed himself when the bridge in his chest had exploded, the remnants of the device were still leaking energy that slowly seared the surrounding flesh. Weak and sore, Tezzeret fled to his home shard Esper on Lara. There, he was met by Tybalt the Trickster, who gloatingly informed Tezzeret about Bolas' death. The artificer was over the moon about the news. Bolas was the only being in the entire multiverse that had the power to fight off and stop Tezzeret's minions. With the god Pharaoh gone, there was no one who could match him. Exalted with joy and eager to plan his next moves, Tezzeret reunited with his minions, the Gargoyle Brock and the Humunculus Krenz, and reoccupied his fortress in the clouds, the Seeker's Sanctum. In the meantime, the wandering Emperor of Kamigawa had discovered that her unnatural ignition had somehow linked her spark to Tezzeret, granting her the unique skill of being able to track him down across the entire multiverse. Fearing the threat that the Artificer could pose now that he had become untethered from Bolas, the Wanderer teamed up with Ral Zarek to aid him in his hunt. The duo eventually found Tezzeret's hiding place on Esper, but before they could get any closer, they were immediately attacked by a squad of Ethereum gargoyles. The Wanderer and Ral easily destroyed all of Tezzeret's minions, but their leader, Grok, managed to escape with his life. The pair then entered Tezzeret's stronghold and, after countless traps and many dangerous foes, they reached the peak of the sanctum where they found the Metal Mage waiting for them. In a matter of seconds, the Wanderer was knocked unconscious by Tezzeret's lead gargoyles and automatically planeswalked away due to his spark's instability, leaving Rall to face Tezzeret alone. The fight was incredibly one-sided, as the Planar Bridge technology allowed Tezzeret to absorb Ral's lightning strikes and redirect them, making the Izzet Guildmaster completely harmless. 
Nonetheless, Raoul would not give up on his mission and challenged Tazareth to continue fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat without any use of magic nor artifice. A wicked smile spread across Tazareth's face as he turned around to mockingly laugh at Raoul's request. In the end, the Metal Mage accepted the Guildmaster's challenge, but again, the fight was terribly one-sided. A few minutes later, Raoul was lying unconscious on the ground in a bloodbath. However, tired of being hunted and for the first time in his entire life, Tazareth decided to show mercy. He spared Raoul's life and gave up his Ethereum arm to Zarek as a fake proof of kill to be reported to the Guild Pact. Shortly after this, Tazareth secretly returned to Ravnica to meet with Lazav, the shapeshifter guildmaster of Ausdemir with whom he had previously formed an alliance to subvert the other guilds. Lazav revealed that, unexpectedly, Raoul had reported the truth about his defeat, which acted as a minor setback for their plans, preventing the same Lazav from being able to blackmail him. Moving on to better news then, Lazav discussed with Tezzeret his plans to blackmail Golgari Guildmaster Rashka, who had decided to spare Ban's life on the plane of Fregatha. In that same occasion, Lazav and Tezzeret also talked about their plans to exploit the new leadership structure of the Orzov through a partnership with Tezar Karlov, and the Demir Guildmaster also revealed that somehow he had already infiltrated the Simic Guild. Five years after his previous visit to the plane, Tezzeret brought Jinja Taxius to the world of Kamigawa through the Planner Bridge to conclude his experiments on completing a fully ignited planeswalker. After a confrontation with Kaito Shizuki, Tameyo, and the Wanderer, Tezzeret and the Phyrexian Praetor managed to abduct Tameyo. After that, Tezzeret rescued Jitaxis' body, who had been cut in half by the Wanderer's blade, and rebuilt it. Then, the two were complicit in the completion of Tameyo. For a while, Tezzeret decided to remain hidden, until one day he made his way to the metropolis of New Capenna, alongside the Praetor Urabrask. While there, the Metal Mage intercepted the planeswalker Vivian Wright, hoping to introduce her to his ally. During their meeting, Tezzeret claimed to be helping Elish Norn to advance her agenda in exchange for a secret resource to which he was willing to risk the entire multiverse and his own safety to obtain. However, the vicious Aspirite Artificer also revealed that he had developed a contingency plan based on the Red Praetor Urabrashk spearheading a coup against Norn. What do you say? Tazaret asked. His usual mocking, twisted smile painted across his face. Would you like to join us? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Planeswalkers 101 featuring the one and only Tezzeret. I hope you enjoyed it and if you did, please consider to subscribe to the channel so that I can continue bringing you guys this awesome videos on MTG's lore. Also, if you want to leave a like and a comment or share this video with your friends, I'd really appreciate that too. Again, thank you so much for watching. My name is Octopus and I will see you in the next one.